and Eurasia. Ben started his career in Russia in 1993 as a freelancer, eventually became Moscow bureau chief for the Daily Telegraph. Uh, he left Russia and then came back um, in 2008, and he has unfortunately left again. He's now in, in Berlin. Um, <clears throat> but uh, during these uh, many decades, he's written uh, numerous articles about the economy. Um, always delight to read. I've, I've said um, I think he's one of the best analysts um, of Russia these days, and I think uh, Chris, Chris Granville, who himself is an analyst whom I move on to, is <laughs> it would, would possibly agree about Ben. We re I read him. Yeah, but, <laughs> but Chris... <laughs> Chris comes to us uh, from London. He is uh, an analyst and has been uh, the general director for uh, uh, Trust, uh, Trust and Silver. Trust and Silver. Now T.S. Lombard. It's, it's an investment research firm. Thank you. Um, and uh, I first met him in Oxford, where he was at All Souls College. And uh, he has had a very distinguished um, career and lived in Russia also um, in, in, in s during some years. Oh, <laughs> you're leaving already? Oh. Um, may I introduce um, uh, Vladimir Gelman, whom I think probably many of you know. Um, he comes to us uh, this time from Finland, but also from Central European University. He's the author or co-author of more than 20 books and 150 research articles, many of them published in English, many of them published in Russian. Uh, he uh, ha has an extraordinary publishing career. He was awarded by the Russian Association of Political Science and the Russian Society of Sociologists for the best research articles. He's been uh, traveled and has been an invited professor in many places, University of Texas in Austin. Um, may I introduce Juliet Johnson? And she comes from the Department of Political Science, McGill University, where uh, at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow, she has been a visiting professor. Her most recent book is Priests of Prosperity, How Central Bankers Transformed the Post-Communist World published in 2010, and she is also author of A Fistful of Rubles, The Rise and Fall of the Russian Banking System. Uh, her Priests of Prosperity won many prizes, so many I can scarcely list them, uh, but <coughs> it's quite a tour de force. May I introduce uh, Maxim Buyev, uh, who is professor at European University of St. Petersburg and vice rector for strategic development at the New Economic School. Also, when you look at his vita, just hundreds of articles, um, on and in, in many uh, magazines and journals, Vietnamosti in finance, on financial institutions and risk, and he pro will address financial institutions. Um, may I introduce, uh, finally, uh, last but not least, Peter Rutland, uh, to whom many uh, US um, economists and political scientists owe a great deal as a uh, co-editor of one of, one, of, one of the best journals, and he's a professor of government, the director of the Alberton Center for the Study of Public Life at Wesleyan University. He has written two major books um, on Central and East Europe, The Politics of Economic Stagnation in the Soviet Union, and in 1985, The Myth of the Plan, but he has edit, edited a third book, The Business and the State in Contemporary Russia, published in 2000, and he writes um, numerous articles. He's a, uh, widely known in the United States as one of the, uh, the great analysts. Uh, so with that introduction, um, I think I want to call on Chris, or Christopher, do you prefer? Chris is fine. Chris, oh, <laughs> excuse me, call on Chris, okay. Um. Oh, Carol, thank you very much. Um, I'll start from the ritual apologies because I'll be speaking my native language. It will be easier for everyone. But I will use opportunity on behalf of all of us to express our gratitude to all our translators. These are very glorious and important workers, so thank you. Carol, you've put me on the spot I to go it. first. <laughs> and uh, I feel that not only on the spot myself personally, but I think we're all in a slightly delicate position because um, in England there is an expression to bring coals to Newcastle, which means uh, you are uh, serving up a, a product which in your surroundings everyone has in abundance, or another version of that proverb is sand to Egypt or something yeah. like that. Well, here we are. Some of us uh, to that. 
Samavar Tatula, Spasiva, then. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, very important. Samavar Tatula. <laughs> Why? What is this Tula? Well, the Tula is, uh, well, not least, uh, Ranjepa, uh, under, its, uh, under its leader, Vladimir Alexandrovich Mao, who, than whom I would say there is no greater expert uh, on the subject, Carol, which you have set for our panel, which is the institutional framework for economic policy making. Now, I personally have been uh, following economic policy in Russia day to day since late 1991 and the fourth Congress of People's Deputies when Boris Yeltsin announced the reform program, appointed Igor Timorovich Gaidar as the first deputy prime minister responsible for the economic reforms. At that point, Vladimir Mao was very closely involved and he's been, as well as an actor, a writer and reflector on all this. So I think in our panel we could do worse almost than just gloss his extremely interesting interview in Viedemosti published earlier this week, which I'm sure all of you have seen, in which he addresses directly, pretty much, Carol, all all the questions uh, <laughs> that you have set. Um, no, I don't think he's with us at this panel. I mean, it's very, it's um, wonderful to see you here on day three of this uh, wonderful forum, and uh, it takes stamina to last until day three. And I'm sure that uh, Vladimir Alexandrovich has got many other things to do. He, unlike the saints of the early church who could miraculously appear in their bodily persons in several places at once, uh, I doubt that even uh, <laughs> Vladimir Alexandrovich could manage this. But in his absence, I think we'll try to try to, in, his, in the spirit of his, of his work, um, uh, which I have always admired, um, try to, to build some ideas and, and give you um, some interesting thoughts to take away and to discuss um, among, among ourselves. As, as I've said, my own qualifications, I think, are sketchy compared to uh, titans such as that, or indeed, for that matter, academic political scientists. As you've said, Carol, I myself am a, a jobbing analyst. I've been, uh, like Ben on my right, I've been following this economic policy drama in Russia for nearly three decades, uh, pretty much every day, and producing uh, analytical interpretation of it for various clients, starting with Her, Her Britannic Majesty's government in the early 1990s when I was a, a junior official at the British Embassy here in Moscow, and since then, uh, mainly various types of uh, investor, mainly financial investor, fund, fund managers, who uh, are interested in, above all in trying to understand the direction of economic policy. Um, and uh, the last remark I'd make by way of uh, what is already an overlong introduction would be uh, on, on economic policy. I, I, speaking personally, and I, I, I would be presumptuous of me to speak for others on the panel, uh, but I'm going to try to stick to your brief, Carol, which is the institutional framework for economic policy. Uh, uh, and although I'll be mentioning plenty of case histories, uh, uh, not least the one that uh, Julius has written about, which is the, uh, the great success of the Central Bank of Russia in the last uh, two to three years in completing the shift to a credible inflation targeting framework for monetary policy, um, I resolve not to digress into policy discussion as such. Uh, the rights and wrongs of one or another solution, what needs to be done, what should be done, uh, deploring what has not been done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you know, we've had that already at the forum uh, from the people who are best qualified to speak, which are the top policymakers themselves. So I think that if we try to ape that discussion, uh, we'd be uh, serving up an ersatz version, uh, a mere shadow of the real thing. So uh, stick, sticking to the brief then of the institutional framework, uh, and perhaps uh, starting with what I, uh, a central case history of, of the inflation targeting story, um, what generalizations can we extract from that about the institutional environment or framework uh, that uh, made, made it possible? Um, and I would uh, mention a couple of things in particular. The, the demand for the reform, that's the first thing. And secondly, uh, the technical uh, capability to implement it successfully. Uh, Carol, you mentioned the technocratic model as something which I think uh, fellow panelists will want to speak, uh, speak to. And uh, 
So I'll, I'll try and get that ball rolling uh, as well. Now, on demand for reform, I mean, let us recall that uh, infl inflation targeting had been spoken about for years before suddenly, in that big bang, in, de in the height of the currency crisis in December 2014, it happened. The shift happened. Uh, up to then, we'd had, we'd had the dirty, crawling peg of the ruble up to the crisis of 2008, and then we'd had a dirty float where the currency was sort of allowed to float. The, uh, obviously, the absolute precondition for a credible inflation targeting regime is a free-floating exchange rate. Uh, but it never quite got all the way. And suddenly, at the heat of the crisis, uh, the, the opportunity is there and is taken. Well, you may say, what a banal thing uh, to, uh, to say. We all know uh, that no good crisis should go to waste and that it's only in, in a crisis point uh, that you have that uh, framework for uh, a profound shift in economic policy. Well, I haven't told you anything you, you didn't know, have I? Um, but let's just reflect on the types of crisis. Uh, the, um, uh, Vladimir Mao, in his uh, interview in Vietnamese, reminded, uh, reminded us this week that the Gaidar program was fully implemented in 1999 by Yevgeny Primakov, the opponent of Gaidar. Uh, why? Because it was only after the shock of the financial debacle in Russia of August the previous year that a proper fiscal adjustment could be carried out uh, because there was no alternative. Uh, the result was uh, an even worse, uh, the result of failing to do that would have been uh, a Zimbabwe type uh, debacle on top of the very severe losses of living standards which had already been uh, uh, occurred as a result of that crisis. Note also that the crisis allows the previous politi political uh, regime to be blamed. Now, obviously, although Yeltsin was still in power, his opponents took control of the government. So you could shift blame to the previous. Uh, so one institutional uh, con uh, conclusion from that, of course, is the rotation of leadership of government is very important for economic policy making because it allows you to shift from inertia. You can blame the predecessor uh, for the inevitable short-term sacrifices and pain which uh, almost always are entailed by the introduction of a new policy. Uh, in the case of the inflation targeting episode in December 2014, uh, the shock, of course, was an external one or a double external one of the oil price collapse and the geopolitical confrontation. Uh, and uh, there was no change of government by definition, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it was a response to an external shock uh, for which the government could position itself as not being to blame, try to do its best in the circumstances. And that also limits the political cost and allows, uh, allows the reform uh, to progress. Uh, so those are kind of the variants in which the, the demand for reform can crystallize and, uh, and the policy can, can uh, be launched. Um, I mentioned, uh, I come to my second and last sort of generalization uh, of a, a pre-prepared policy package which is ready to go and where uh, there is a, uh, a capable cadre, cadre of officials and senior policymakers who can implement it. And I think this is extremely important. In the case of inflation targeting, as I mentioned, it had been discussed over many previous years and never quite implemented. Suddenly, it came in. Now, I, I think you can see other, uh, other uh, examples as well. Um, for example, in the famous uh, reform period in the first term of, uh, of President Putin, uh, when German Greff was uh, uh, coordinating uh, the economic reform program overall, suddenly you had a lot of reforms which suddenly came in. And they weren't just magicked out of the air. The staff work for that had all been done in the previous years, including in the 1990s, when there wasn't the political foundation to go ahead with it. I'm thinking in particular, for example, of the legislation in 2002, uh, which provided the uh, foundation for the private ownership of agricultural land. Um, 
This is almost right up there with the liberation of the, of the serfs in, in 1861, uh, which, Carol, you've written about in brilliant scholarly work, uh, because uh, it then took another decade or two for the fruits of that structural reform to manifest themselves in the surging agricultural output which we see today. Uh, but that work had been done. It was simply that politically it was impossible in the 1990s. Uh, and, uh, but the, the groundwork had been laid. It was already there. And when the political conditions were in place, then it happened. Uh, and uh, look at Ukraine today. Even now, with, you would think every possible incentive uh, on the political front, geopolitical front for radical reform, they still cannot fully overcome these shibboleths. Uh, it's a tough word for the Piriborski. Uh, these ideological barriers uh, which uh, prevent even today in Ukraine a proper statutory framework for private ownership of agricultural land, where the country's uh, main comparative advantage, or one of its main comparative advantages, lie. Now, on that particular subject, there was no actual crisis in 2002 or 2001, but simply that the resistance had fallen away. So it's crisis, change of government, or just resistance falling away. Uh, perhaps the expression might be tak jit nezia. We can't go on without private ownership of agricultural land, and it can come in. So in the case of inflation targeting, fast forwarding back to 2014-15, uh, there was all the work had been done, and in the central bank, there was a cadre of people. Now, I'd really like to end on this point, because um, Vladimir Mao, in his interview in Vietnamese earlier this week, said um, uh, that he congratulated the central bank on their political courage in, in implementing this uh, inflation targeting, and now low inflation has been, I think, quite justifiably termed an institution in itself, not just some technocratic detail which, uh, which we can applaud while deploring the lack of underlying structural reforms, but a structural institutional reform in its own right. But uh, I think that uh, Vladimir Alexandrovich slightly understates the case when he said that uh, the inflation targeting was not in itself intellectually challenging. He compared it with the huge conundrum of how to organize health care and how to finance health care, for example. Well, I would agree that inflation targeting does not involve inventing anything. It has been done in many countries with great success uh, in recent decades. However, it does need serious intellectual resources to do it, and the central bank has them. It has outstanding analysts who have created dynamic factor models with lags of 12 and 24 months, plus a monetary element to construct an, indica an indicator of core inflation uh, uh, on which is based a much more sophisticated approach to interest rate setting uh, than would appear to the naked eye, and which we haven't got time to get into now, uh, but um, which is possible because they have excellent people. When I was working for many years in Moscow in uh, financial intermediaries, uh, especially local investment banks and brokerages here, I was very pleased to have brilliant colleagues uh, who, with superb um, uh, quantitative econometric and modeling capabilities, uh, who had been educated either at Rassiske Ekonomiske Schola or Vyshe Ekonomiske Schola, but I then said, thought to myself, well, it's good, for, it's good for me as a partner and shareholder in this company, but it's not so good for the country. I mean, some of these people in Western countries would be working in the finance ministry and central bank. And all of a sudden, they are. Now, yeah. partly this must be because the salaries are a bit more acceptable, especially in the central bank of Russia. Uh, and um, the, e the era of vulgar salaries in financial intermediation is probably behind us. But also, it's because there is a demand for expertise because the reform is happening. Um, what, uh, a famous British politician called Nigel Lawson, before he became the finance minister of Britain and actually began to introduce inflation targeting uh, back in the late 1980s, had been the energy minister. And he, it was he who, under Margaret Thatcher, broke open uh, various product markets in the UK, electricity, uh, gas, uh, and, and other energy markets, water, as energy minister. And uh, he attracted brilliant people from academia, from think tanks, uh, from the financial sector, 
because his ministry became what he called a think tank with teeth. <laughs> the teeth meaning that you could actually transfer your thinking into action which changed the country. So in other words, if you have demand for reform, the technical capability, you will attract the people, no, providing, of course, the salary is acceptable, uh, who will then uh, be attracted by you know, having that set of teeth that what they do can change their country. Uh, and I think that is the other conclusion I draw from inflation targeting. I've already gone on far too long. I'll stop there. Uh, and um, in further discussion, uh, I could contribute points on forward-looking reforms, in particular the crucial reform, it seems to me, of um, individu individuale pensione capital, uh, the, the next stage of investment pensions. Because this is a reform which is institutionally blocked and where you see the, the, what I call the kind of the parliament of the bureaucracy. This is the institutional feature of, of, of the referee, ultimately being the president, the only institution which, which functions in Russia properly. Uh, being the referee and actually holding debates and having sort of gladiatorial contests between uh, proponents and opponents of this crucial reform uh, and, um, and then seeing who is most convincing. So that's something we can talk about more. Uh, Carol, in our discussions before, I just said I wanted to refer to the judiciary, but I, 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 perhaps we can come back to that because otherwise I would have gone on far too long already. Uh, but I think of all the institutions which are relevant to economic policy, there's one which seems remote, but which is so important because without it, you have no defense of property rights, and that is the judiciary. But I'm sure others will have more interesting and more learned things than, than me to say about that. And if, as and when they might do, I might chip in with some other <laughs> remarks on that. But I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was a superb introduction to, uh, to this discussion. Uh, Vladimir, can I call on you next? Start slides, and I will need uh, this um, sort of. Uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, subscribe to um, uh, to. Uh, say my words of gratitude to the organizers and also many thanks to Carol for organizing this uh, uh, discussion today. And what I would like to uh, talk about today is uh, actually touches upon different um, measurements, uh, different uh, tools for the measurement of uh, politics and policy making. Uh, you can see a slide here. The next one, please. If you allow me to start with a person with a, uh, that is uh, well known to um, everyone, uh, one of the creators of the uh, Russian economic policy, Alexei Ulukaev, who occupied a prominent uh, posts in the government, and right now he is um, in uh, jail. Um, uh, but I would like to step back uh, a little bit. Uh, 23 years, actually, ago, um, uh, uh, referring to some quotes, uh, some. Uh, a few things that uh, were mentioned by Ulukaev himself. He wrote um, um, an article which was uh, titled The Politics in the Transition Period, where he actually declared openly uh, uh, that there is, uh, when you make uh, political decisions, um, uh, that it, it was necessary to, uh, it was necessary at that time uh, not to take into account the uh, public opinion, uh, the people's views when you make expert decisions. Uh, I would like to, to say at this point the, that the Gaida Forum participants uh, follow Ulukaev's tenets and commandments, so to say, and those who were present at yesterday's plenary session will probably notice that uh, 
uh, when uh, they were voting on the accountability uh, tools, only uh, very few of them uh, chose the representative democracy institutions. But in fact, what Ulykhaev said in public, there's nothing new in that as the majority of people who are responsible for implementation of political courts uh, in uh, various countries of the world are quite ready to subscribe to the same view. So, in other words, uh, it's, uh, they can do it. They can make sure uh, uh, that the uh, op public opinion would not have any impact on uh, political decision-making. If uh, we look uh, into the history of uh, various economic reforms, so we can see that, of course, it's a kind of a technocratic model that prevailed uh, over the centuries in many countries, including uh, Russia today, and it still prevails in Russia today. But the thing is that uh, over the last decade, we have not uh, seen a history of success, uh, but rather a history of failures. In uh, a book which uh, has been translated recently into Russian by William Easterly, the, th the Tyranny of Experts, offers a detailed review uh, of why the technocratic model failed in many uh, third world countries. So the question that I'm more concerned with is how this technocratic model um, Ulukaev is one of the proponents of this uh, model, how it works in conditions of modern day, day Russia, where um, all the specialists and various agencies, uh, including the World Bank, have um, observed uh, the low level of uh, uh, management, uh, of government management, or bad governments, as they say in the Russian, we say uh, just poor uh, management. Uh, in other words, uh, what we can say that in the Russian conditions we see a phenomenon that can be called a technocratic trap. Uh, on the one hand, we see uh, uh, good intentions and wishful thinking uh, in uh, the area of social policies that uh, Christopher has just mentioned, but in the meantime, the technocrats uh, the, who are bound to implement these reforms, translating them into life, are bound uh, head and foot uh, by various interested uh, parties, interested groups, uh, those who are seeking uh, their profit, uh, facing the low uh, bureaucrat uh, low quality, deplorable bureaucratic app machinery, and uh, also um, at the same time, since they are isolated. Uh, from politics, they are limited in their capability uh, of uh, creating uh, broad coalitions that may involve uh, various uh, political forces uh, to support uh, reforms. So what's the main trump card held by the technocrats, by those advanced economists, experts in uh, mm, various figures, including the uh, people who were speaking here uh, during uh, in the preceding uh, days? Uh, well, in fact, uh, it's the pri uh, priority support on behalf of political leaders, um, on behalf of the state. But uh, the trouble here is that the, this support is uh, conditional and the priorities may change with time. And secondly, uh, not all reform areas uh, can be written into priority um, areas. Uh, uh, only certain uh, individual areas can be uh, seen uh, regarded as priority measures. Why technocrats are needed by political leaders, in fact? Why uh, various leaders uh, attract uh, qualified experts? Uh, uh, and uh, partially, this is what Christopher has mentioned already, it's their reaction to external uh, shocks. So to a certain extent, the uh, technocrats in the government play the same role as uh, crisis managers in the company. So if the company is not doing well and you need to uh, um, invite some managers that will help you to get out of the crisis or at least n not to uh, allow the situation worsen further. On the other hand, uh, 
also you needed some kind of a foolproof uh, mechanism that would uh, uh, put a blockage to uh, harmful decisions in terms of uh, political decisions and economic decisions. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. But as you hire technocrats, as they hire technocrats, the political leaders provide a certain autonomy and freedom of maneuver uh, for them. But using their authority, they are separating them from public opinion, uh, sometimes uh, from some interested uh, groups, but in the meantime, the political leaders are uh, themselves evaluate their results of their work. But we see that uh, political leaders that not always are not always capable of um, making a proper assessment of their work. Uh, well, of course, uh, some lobbying uh, is involved here. Also, this kind of assessment comes sometimes comes too late. Sometimes the aftermath of decisions made are not quite obvious. So the Christopher has drawn an example uh, you know, saying that, uh, for example, the Gaidar's program was implemented only seven years after the reform started. Well, sometimes it's vice versa. Some uh, corrections uh, are made too late. So it's quite natural that in, uh, under such a situation, uh, the political uh, support from uh, the leaders uh, of the country is uh, is a very subtle and a, is a very unstable point. So the coalition to supporting uh, these transformations, uh, which uh, are were um, developed on the upper stories of the state machinery, turn out to be quite the opposite. So with time. Uh, the uh, role of technocrats in uh, political uh, policies is going down and they uh, have very little impact on any song. So the implementation of 2010-2020 uh, program, which was developed by the Center of Strategic Research uh, headed by Dmitry, um, uh, so shows that the first part of the program was implemented only uh, was only 36 percent and the second section was only 29 percent uh, so that's which is quite a low value if we consider uh, what they actually have done uh, that's uh, probably due not only to the fact that the technocrats themselves are um, very weak politically but also to the fact um, that there are certain forces uh, that are interested in implementing and pursuing certain firms, while others are not. So depending on the political cycles that push them towards uh, certain priorities, uh, well, of course, uh, first of all, yeah, they're interested in uh, uh, seeing as uh, fast as possible the immediate results of their reforms. So it's quite uh, um, uh, typical that in the early uh, 2000s, uh, the tax reform was implemented, and uh, on the other hand, the pension reform uh, was uh, wrapped up, and uh, which uh, led to a final compromise, and finally uh, was uh, postponed until indefinite times. Well, uh, secondly, there is no confidence uh, in the fact that even the right decisions that have been adopted can be implemented. So the example of um, a successful financial policy, which is pursued by the central bank, uh, can be understood uh, if we compare this uh, with the reforms in the social policy sphere. Inflation targeting and other important things in financial policies can be resolved by a small circle of specialists that are mm, uh, sitting at the same table. However, we cannot expect uh, uh, the same from uh, them if we, we, we need coordination between different agencies, regional bureaucracies, and so on and so forth. But of course, they are seeking uh, profit, and the technocrats, as they try to achieve their goals, they are trying to um, um, unfold this spiral of uh, super regulation, as we say uh, in the state. So, uh, by virtue of such circumstances, we are facing the problem of priorities uh, of political leaders uh, who can also change and uh, Russia's experience after 2014 when uh, uh, the uh, political uh, priori priorities were pushed backward. Um, uh, as compared to geopolitical interests, what of course is quite indicative in this sense. And uh, 
Well, uh, wrapping up my uh, presentation, let me get back to uh, Mr. Ulukaev. If you could display one of the first slides, uh, slide number three, please. So the uh, destiny of uh, the uh, minister reformer is um, quite um, indicative in this sense. Uh, as you know, Ulukaev was uh, blamed uh, with uh, uh, bribery. Uh, so there's a case of bribery. Many specialists believe it uh, was ungrounded, unjustified. But the fact is that uh, as a result of his uh, resignation and subsequent uh, jailing, uh, well, mm, well, of course, that depended on the knowledge of experience rather than the results of voting or political priorities. But the trouble is that it was the uh, knowledge and the experience of uh, those uh, profit uh, seekers, um, not of the reformers. And uh, the tools, uh, the weapons that used by the reformers, uh, that w which they used to fight the economic policy, the opposition to reform, turned out against them, turned against them, in fact. So in this sense, the question arises whether this technocratic medicine that is offered as a, a good tool for economic policies, well, probably it may prove to be even worse than the disease itself. Thank you. But Continued discussion now. I'm going to move back to an analyst, a non-academic, uh, Ben Harris. Thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, I don't think I describe myself as an analyst I'm more of a specialist um, you know my job as a journalist and we are here to be any to describe the story but then we describe it in detail so maybe it boils down to the same thing at the end of the day um, the particular samovar I thought I'd bring to Tula um, is at BNE, we spend a lot of our time trying to explain to uh, half our readers are in the West um, and explain, uh, particularly in the Russia story, the Russian perspective on the relationships. Um, for example, the NATO expansion has been a particularly spicy topic. And the West say, you know, it's purely defensive. Um, but the point we always make, you know, from the Russian perspective, defensive weapons are only defensive if you're standing behind them. If you're standing. <laughs> If you're standing in front of them, there's still like a gun with a bullet in it. Um, however, what I thought I'd make my brief comments on, um, maybe more interesting to you, is we also talk to a lot of uh, foreign investors working in Russia. And I think it highlights the whole problem with the institutions very nicely in so much as foreign investors coming in to Russia, which is, of course, a huge market, biggest market in Europe by a long shot uh, in terms of number of people and in potential sales is um, they're very dependent on the institutions because they don't have the access to the administrative resources that Russian companies do. There's no Krisha, for example. They, they want to make their investments on the basis of laws and stable tax system and profit margins and capital controls, repatriation, etc. And one of the quirks of the Russian market is because of the um, problems or insufficiencies with the institutions, that you have a phenomena where you have economies of scale. In other words, if you look around at the foreign in investors here, they're all big, because you need to be of a certain size so that you can steamroll the problems, that you can plow through your bureaucratic institutional problems in order to set up your business. But the flip side of those institutional problems is that the margins are extremely high. The barriers to entry are high, so the competition is limited. And the upshot of this is that all the foreign investors who are here love it. And they're making huge profits. And they're reinvesting every penny, or ruble, into expanding their businesses. But the ones who are not here won't come. They won't even look at it, because they say it's too dangerous, it's too political, it's too unstable. And you get people like Warren Buffett, you know, famous investor, won't even look at Russia, because uh, it, so you, Th this quirk with the institutions also means that there's no boilerplate way of doing it, that systems that you would introduce in other markets, you have to purpose build everything here. It has to be specific to the Russian market. And all of this is slowing uh, things down. These high margins are actually a tax on the economy. 
uh, although it makes the companies a lot of profits, um, it's cost that's passed on to the consumers, so the cost of goods are higher. I don't know, I mean, the, the online taxi Yandex phenomena is a good example that once you had a really open, unregulated competition, the cost of riding around in a taxi plummeted. But we don't see that in, in all the other businesses. And it's hidden as well. The example, we're working on a story which we actually haven't been able to pin down. But um, Aushan, for example, has a huge retail business. However, when they're being supplied, they're being supplied by intermediary companies that buy in in bulk, you know, potatoes, nuts, plastic goods, whatever they are. And then that's the process where all the kickbacks are paid, but it's paid at a level at these intermediary companies. So Aushan itself has a clean, white business and doesn't see any of this. But again, those corruption uh, cause inefficiencies and an effect is the tax. On the, uh, on the population who have to bear the extra cost of paying all this money. I think the final thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is that Russia today operates a hybrid system that is part free market and part um, oligarchy. And why I say that, in 2007 we did a com uh, cover story called Zao Kremlin, closed stock company Kremlin, where Putin at that time started doing these one-on-one -on -one meetings with captains of industry in order to make company plans dovetail with Kremlin priorities and projects. Uh, and it's not an un, you know, unreasonable thing to do. However, um, as time has progressed, you know, the circle of people he deals with has become smaller and smaller, and you can divide the economy now into politicized sectors like oil and gas and into um, apolitical sectors like retail. And then on the one hand, you've got the liberal reformers headed by Nabulina, Selyanov, um, uh, and uh, Reshkin. Uh, yeah, Reshkin, uh, Ulikaev as well. Um, that was a shame. And on the other hand, you've got you know, the Timchenko, Rottenberg, Putin, you know, Inner Circle, Ketch Bridge, uh, Power of Siberia Pipeline which is all run on the basis of, of personal um, uh, relationships between the president and top businessmen. And again, I can see the rationale behind it because it's a way of controlling corruption, not eradicating it. But then if you're done with people who are close to you, then um, you can keep you know, the stealing to a reasonable level and that you can ensure budget funds, huge budget funds that are spent on these projects actually go into what they're supposed to. But it creates various problems um, in terms of the, in an oligarchic system, there's no rule of succession. So we have built-in political instability uh, when Putin finally comes to the end of his term. Whereas you've got the liberals on the other hand who are desperately trying to build the framework, the institutional framework, in order to allow capitalist free market business to operate. You know, I'm listening to the panel session yesterday with Oreshkin and Nabulina, and Russia needs to be another Norway, which was one of the things that came out. And that's all right and good, but you take Paul Suryanov, who's trying to raise the missing two trillion rubles from the budget last year, turns to Gazprom Rosneft and says, pay 50% dividends, which is the right of the government to ask for and makes sense. And they're like, uh, no, we decided not to. We're gonna spend that money on building our empire. And so you've got Russia, particularly from the foreign investors' point of view, is this mixed system. And so they're gonna look at some sectors and say, that's fine, um, and we're gonna invest in Rocco, Spanish toilet makers. Russia is now the, by far the biggest maker of toilets in Europe. I thought that was a great post. Um, and things have got more interesting because following the devaluation in 2014, the cost of labor here has fallen so much Russia is actually in the position now to start exporting goods. And where has it happened first? Because Russia famously doesn't make anything except uh, raw material exports. Uh, it's in the, in the automotive sector, where you've got all these state-of-the-art factories, world-class, with state-of-the-art management, that are now being produced cheap enough so that you can send them overseas and make an income from it. And it's in, happening in a small way, but it's the first sort of you know, made in Russia product that's being exported. But it's being led by the foreigners because the foreigners own all these factories. So that's a good thing. But again, you need the institutions in order to support the domestic business, which I haven't talked about at all, who are in a position to do that. Um, unfortunately, from my perspective, the only really vibrant and interesting part of the Russian economy from 
domestic non-raw material production is the tech sector and tech sector and and well, and agriculture as well um, but that I count as a raw material so the final point I make is that the institution reform um, is now front and fore in the liberal fraction of the government's mind and the lack of money following the ruble or the oil price collapse has actually driven the government to make some of these reforms simply because there's not enough money to go around and I was interviewing um, IBS, a huge software development um, company, yesterday, and they were giving me some of the details about all the IT spending that's gone in the tax ministry. And the, the tax service has been merged with the custom service, and the upshot of this is a widget, a good, that crosses the border, is now traced by this IT service all the way through to when it leaves the shelf. And tax revenues, particularly VAT, have gone up by 40%. And from the foreign investor's point of view, this is fine. They don't care what the level of tax is. They complain when they go up, but they don't care what it is. They just want to know what it is, and it's going to stay at that level. And so this reform, because customs in particular was famously corrupt, is a huge step forward. So I see progress being made, but of course there's a lot to be done, and you still have this problem of the economies of scale, large companies, foreign investors, the only ones that can come in and you need all the smaller companies. I know in, in Czech Republic and Germany, they're very interested. The, the, the Mittelstand, you know, the, the you know, 50 people, $2 million turnover companies, they want to come as well, but they're defeated by the bureaucracy. And it's not just corruption, it's the bureaucracy, red tape, you know, just the, the, the logistics, <laughs> the difficulties of doing business here. If you're not of a big enough size, then that becomes onerously expensive, so you don't come. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. I always feel it necessary to insert my own little point of view about the importance of some regions um, having uh, really good institutions. And I was delighted to see the president of Tatarstan on, on, on day one, and he can certainly brag about institutions in Tatarstan. I think uh, for the auto industry, you know, we all know that the political institutions in areas where the auto is taking off are, are pretty good. I think um, Russia is the fastest growing pharmaceuticals market in the world. And that really takes private property institutions. And we haven't, we haven't talked about that. I, th I think Chris Granville uh, could, could have mentioned that. He's written about that. So um, I, I like the fact that we're talking about institutions. And I'm hoping that we will connect more to each other um, and in, in, uh, in our comments. Can I move forward back to the academics? Juliet, would you like to go? Sure, I'd be happy to, and I have slides, too. Uh, so thank you so much, Carol, uh, for inviting me to this forum. I'm very happy to be here and to be addressing with my colleagues what's arguably the most important developmental questions for Russia today, and those involve the extent to which Russia's institutions can respond to or potentially be better made to respond to Russia's serious economic challenges. And I think actually my presentation will tie in very well with what, uh, with what uh, Christopher, Volodya, and Ben have already said, particularly because I mean, Carol had mentioned uh, my, recent, my recent book in the introduction, Priests of Prosperity, where I look at comparative central bank reform in the post-communist world. And one of the key uh, themes that I raise in that book is the consequences of having liberal development um, and technocratic progress in a very narrow set of institutions. Um, so you have, uh, this leads to problems of relationships between institutions and, uh, and uh, something, something that I've called uh, an asymmetric development, which has, which has some serious consequences and those consequences I'm going to get into in this particular presentation, which focuses on the lessons Russia has learned in the institutional development that has and has not taken place because of the successive currency crises that Russia has experienced since uh, its macroeconomic stabilization in 1995. Uh, and this paper comes out of, a, uh, uh, this talk comes out of a paper that I did with David Woodruff, who's at the London School of Economics. I've got the site up there. If anybody would like the paper itself, please feel free to contact me. Uh, but here I'm just going to focus on some of, the, uh, some of the key points here. And so if we could have the next slide. Uh, 
You all know this. Uh, currency crises have been a recurrent feature of Russia's post-Soviet experience. So here's just a reminder of the three major currency crises that have, that have occurred since that initial stabilization in 1995. You have 1998, 2008, and the crisis, the most recent crisis, which we characterize as one that wasn't just limited to December 2014, but it's actually a, a dual-pronged crisis that, uh, that went through 2016 in terms of currency dynamics. And so what we want to argue here is that Russia is unusually vulnerable to crisis because of two interrelated factors. That's its dependence on oil and gas revenues, so energy revenues, and its dependence on international investment capital. And we see this in the direct effect of international commodity prices on Russia's state budget. We see this in the significant weight of the energy industry in influencing cross-border capital movements. And we also see it in the importance of international capital to the everyday operation of the Russian economy. So what you have prior to each of these currency crises is both an international capital crunch and a significant drop in world oil prices. So of course the 1998 crisis is preceded by the Asian financial crisis and a fall in oil prices, 2008 by the global financial crisis, um, withdrawal of international capital and an oil price drop, and of course 2014 to 16, you have capital inflows drying up because of the sanctions regime and then the quite dramatic collapse in world oil prices. Of course, these factors aren't the only reasons that crisis occurred. Each crisis has its own dynamics, but they're the common thread that run through all three. So what I want to talk about here is what we can learn from a comparison of these crises, keeping these structural vulnerabilities in mind. And again, there's lots of details in the paper, so in this presentation, I just want to make three short points. First, we can have the next slide. This is the good news. Russian authorities have become a lot better at managing currency crises once they've occurred. Here's the institutional, the technocratic development. So if you think back to 1998, I think sometimes a lot of people forget how terribly traumatic that was. There was no safety net. You had a fixed, overvalued exchange rate. You had no meaningful international reserves to speak of. You had high government debt. So when the crisis came, this meant a very sharp currency collapse government debt default, and no easy way to recover. So this was a real economic catastrophe that brought down the government. And there was some learning from this process. As energy, energy prices went up again, international reserves were built up. And you couldn't do that just because of high oil. It's not just an accident. It's also because the government became better able to tax oil and gas revenues. So you have to give some credit for that. Then you had the creation of the Stabilization Fund in 2004, which is later split into the Reserve Fund and the National Welfare Fund, and the government paid off its debt. And all of this means, all of this institutional development and preparation means that when you have the crisis in 2008, there's a much softer landing. You have no pressure because of government debt. The central bank could use reserves to support the ruble. And they did, if you'll recall, spend over $200 billion in about six months. Then when we get to 2014, the situation is even better. The central bank has developed even more effective monetary policy tools. The reserves have been built back up. So when the crisis hits, the government is able to coordinate foreign exchange sales with state-owned enterprises and banks. The, C the central bank and the finance ministry are able to use reserves uh, to, to you know, moderate, not stop the crisis, but moderate it. Uh, the central bank hikes interest rates, and this is actually meaningful when interest rate policy wasn't meaningful back in 1998, and are able to move to this managed float and inflation targeting. So you still have a crisis, you still have a recession, but again, it's a softer landing. So in sum, we have stronger capabilities now to deal with these currency crises when they arise. But that brings me to the second point and the next slide. This is the bad. At the same time as these capabilities have increased, Russia's structural dependencies on energy resources and international capital not only remained after the crises in 1998 and 2008, but were arguably actually reinforced. So while the crisis management skills became stronger, so did the structural dependencies that made Russia vulnerable to crisis in the first place. And you know, we certainly all know that the Russian budget continued to be highly dependent on energy revenues 
If you look at oil and gas, they accounted for approximately two-thirds of export revenue in 2008 and 2013 before the crisis, and that was up from less than a third in 1997 before that first crisis. And you see this vulnerability reflected in the currency dynamics. And here's the next slide. Thanks. So this shows the close relationship between the oil price and the ruble exchange rate. I mean, the first divergence you see is, um, is the spending of reserves to prop up the ruble after the 2008 crisis. The second is the central bank rebuilding the foreign exchange reserves. But in essence, the less intervention you have, the tighter the tie has been. And there's a, there's a little divergence now. And if I um, played out the chart, you'd see it more. But you know, I, I might argue, and we can talk about it in the Q&A, that, uh, that we can't really tell much from that yet. Um, and then if you show the next slide, here you can see the dependence on international capital flows. You have a buildup of external debt before the crisis, you have small drop afterwards, and then it rises again. And again, you'd see even more if we extended this chart, because this is from our paper that came out this past fall. You will note the change in character of debt. Right? You'll remember that the key debt was sovereign debt in 1998, and you had, that's why you had the uh, GKO default. But now it's not. The sovereign debt has been replaced by commercial debt, but the underlying vulnerability is still there. And here I want to insert that it, international capital is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a very good thing. Russia clearly needs international capital. But it creates vulnerability because, first, it's volatile. Right. Second, it tends to retreat at the same time oil prices fall. So in Russia's case, it, it, it's pro-cyclical. And third, in Russia, it's actually been used as a substitute for domestic flight capital, for investment by the domestic financial sector, and on the government side, for the inability to sufficiently increase taxes or cut budgets in many cases. So what happens after 1998, and certainly after 2008, is the reinforcement of these structural vulnerabilities despite a general understanding that they're a problem, despite serious calls after each crisis for modernization, for diversification, for strengthening of the domestic financial sector so it can better provide investment capital. And these are the same calls for reform we hear now. We've heard them after the previous crises. We're hearing them now. And in many cases in, at this forum, too, we're hearing them from exactly the same people. So now let me say a few things about what's happened with the most recent crisis. Is there actually hope that this experience is leading to reforms that are going to diminish these vulnerabilities and end the boom-bust cycle? And here's where we get to my last slide, which is the ugly, um, the ugly paradox. I would argue that the increasing ability of the macroeconomic authorities to manage currency crises and to soften their impact when they hit has actually had the paradoxical effect of lowering the incentives to undertake more important, deeper structural reforms uh, that are going to reduce these vulnerabilities in the future. So again, think about 1998. In contrast to 1998, when the crisis did lead to significant political and economic transformation in 2008 and in 2014-16, the tools worked. The crisis was contained. So in, 20, in 2008, this certainly meant that economic reform, I mean, serious economic reform was stalled. This may happen again now because the immediate sense of urgency is gone. Inflation is more or less under control. There's some growth. Oil prices have gone back up a bit. Um, some international capital is returning despite sanctions. You know, we know there are issues, but, but I, I don't think people feel the crisis situation in the same way, certainly in not every realm of government. And here I might disagree with, with Ben a little bit in his presentation. Um, so I'm somewhat pessimistic that real reform is going to occur. Uh, but I want to end by pointing out that complacency is going to be especially dangerous at this time, given current trends in the energy and capital markets, right? So you think about not long after 1998, not long after 2008, world energy prices rose significantly, and international capital came back into Russia. And this gave the economy an external boost. But this time, we have different external conditions. Oil prices may indeed be lower for longer. We've got a little boost now, but the US shale industry arguably puts an upper limit on the price that oil can reach now. 
This is going to make it difficult to res rebuild the reserve fund while keeping a balanced budget and maintaining government programs. And indeed, we, just as we know, this past month the reserve fund has disappeared, hopefully temporarily, but it has indeed disappeared. International capital is probably going to be scarcer for longer as well. The ongoing sanctions are going to continue to suppress the level in of investment capital in Russia. Ben's also pointed out some other conditions that, are, that make it difficult. And I also want to note that impending central bank policy normalization in the advanced industrial democracies means that a lot of investors are no longer going to be as interested in searching for yield in comparatively risky emerging market economies like Russia. So even if there seems to be little immediate risk of another currency crisis, these long-term dynamics actually make it more important than ever for Russia to tackle these structural vulnerabilities head on. And again, we know exactly what needs to be done, right? Many people of this, at this conference have already pointed it out. You need economic diversification. You need to build a more dynamic domestic financial system. You need to bring flight capital home. You need to improve the judiciary. And above all, you need to break the ties between political patronage and economic success. So this is nothing new, but this is also nothing easy. And frankly, you know, under current conditions, I think it might be uh, somewhat impossible. But without breaking these dependencies, I would argue that another currency crisis is probably inevitable, no matter how good Russia's macroeconomic management may be. And it is indeed, I think, quite good. Thanks. And once Russia solves this problem with the Russian economy, uh, it can go to the United States where some of the same problems are. <laughs> uh, Maxim. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Carol. Thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this panel. Uh, to a certain extent, I actually jumped uh, uh, into the last uh, uh, train car uh, that is going away. So as I'm uh, going to tell you, uh, not uh, about the institutions, but rather about uncertainty around the uh, economic reform. So what I'm going to tell you about is kind of an introduction into a certain theory, into some research that have been published already um, in respect of the American economy. And what I'm doing precisely at this point uh, with my colleagues in St. Petersburg Uni University, which I represent the, uh, today here. Well, possibly that's uh, somewhat is somewhat different from the overall um, um, theme of our discussion. But last year, Carol also invited me to this panel, uh, to some panel discussion, and I made a presentation there devoted to systems. Uh, risks and the evaluation of these risks uh, uh, for the Russian economy. Uh, the, the same that uh, exercise that we do in, at the um, university and um, uh, six months later it was awarded um, as the best um, work in an economy by the Gaidar Institute. So first slide please. That's a quite a well-known uh, slide, the chart here that's um, uh, the um, outcome of uh, the efforts of three scientists from Chicago University that's about six to seven years ago created the uh, Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. Well, in fact, the methods behind this index is analysis of texts and the search uh, of wor uh, the keywords in the text related to uncertainty. Uh, so it was basically uh, some uh, political uh, and economic nouns and economic nouns uh, which help us to construct a kind of an index at like this so you can go to the site politicaluncertainty.com i think it's um, uh, on devoted to um, eight countries uh, the most detailed on uh, the united states and the uk as possibly uh, there's uh, an index uh, that is relevant to Russia, which, as you can see here, is between 92 and 2018. So the, here, the light, latest data that we, we see here. So it's actually, this is analysis of, of uh, the um, keywords in um, commerçant newspaper articles. As you can see here, as uh, Vladimir Putin took his office in 2000, 
in the year 2000, the level of political uncertainty measured by uh, this index dropped uh, radically in Russia, which is good as compared as opposed to the 90s. But uh, beginning in Uh, but if we look uh, at the period towards the Crimea, uh, uh, more to the Crimean period, uh, which is up to December 2017, we can see that the average, um, the, the volatility uh, uh, has increased of the index, uh, increase uh, that is a medium level, uh, which is uh, roughly around 207, which is much higher as compared to the uh, first years of Vladimir Putin's uh, governance. Um, so as you can see that uh, the market right now is um, sort of um, in a more vague conditions uh, as opposed to the previous years. Well, of course, it's very interesting. You can kick around this uh, index, but over the last three years, the researchers uh, have been trying um, uh, the, the uh, trying to garner as much as possible from this index, uh, looking at what's uh, going to happen to pricing uh, policy. In Chicago, there is a school uh, headed by the so, uh, person whose name is Brian Kelly, uh, they, uh, who are dealing with the uh, risk management, uh, risk measurement, and also with the classical uh, Markowitz uh, theory. <coughs> um, as they try to um, stretch out this index, um, applying this to the um, goals of financial activity, of uh, economic activity as well. So over the last five years, we've seen uh, also quite interesting papers that are trying to uh, identify the impact of prices uh, on the world market. So it's quite interesting to see that, because it's not only the securities market, um, but whether the uh, uh, the political uncertainty affects uh, uh, the asset uh, prices. So if, we look, if you look at the portfolio, investment portfolios, and how the investors are trying to build up the best portfolio they can, so we look at the, how the uh, corporate finance um, sector evaluates uh, the profit margin, the margin of a certain project, and is trying to understand the discount rate for certain capitals. So, so they, first of all, they look at the expected uh, risk premium uh, without the uh, looking into the uh, central bank interest rate. But much depends on uh, how the economic agents um, uh, form their expectations. So that's uh, premium. Uh, without the uh, interest uh, margin risk. Uh, There's one of the interesting economic theories that we uh, researchers have been trying to evaluate over the last 40 years. So there are different risk premium components. And as you know, that these different components are, are not stable at the same time. And so they vary uh, much. Uh, so the Uh, the empirical measurements were done by uh, Kelly, Pastor, uh, Veronese, and uh, so the latest model allows us to determine how much uh, the political uncertainty affects uh, uh, the asset prices. And also, exactly what component of this political uncertainty can be ascribed to uh, the changes in asset prices. So these three uh, researchers uh, uh, three years ago offered the most popular methodology for um, uh, risk assessment. So um, uh, it's, um, on the whole, it's uh, quite clear. So there have been uh, some uh, research papers that uncertainty about fiscal policy has negative effects on economic activity. It's also understandable that political uncertainty uh, increases unemployment and reduces investment. The Baker is the author of that index. How we can uh, judge uh, that? Um, so, well, of course, you can take this index and you can take uh, other uh, variables uh, targeting different um, uh, figures and are trying to compare them. So we at the university, our team has tried to uh, see whether it affects the level of the systems risk. Uh, so the more recent work uh, 
in uh, as we looked uh, with our uh, laboratory team uh, whether it correlates with the systems uh, risk index uh, maybe it's it's not uh, the exact uh, title for that risk uh, which was uh, published by the uh, russian uh, ratings agency, there's, there's quite a strong correlation that they have offered in that. But methodologically is uh, actually wrong because the way that it was developed by the authors, it includes not only political uncertainty, but it can also include some emotional words in uh, economic and political uh, terms. It may also involve uh, some uncertainty uh, due to uh, certain actions by the government uh, in terms of the package of reforms, macroeconomic uh, uncertainty, price uncertainty, fundamental factors. So it's, it's not just a simple regression. You have to look into s different factors here. Kelly, uh, Pastor and Veronese, uh, just recently they offered uh, some new ideas, uh, some new models. Um, to uh, make this assessment. So they decided to look into the options uh, market. So let me describe this in uh, briefly, in a few words. Uh, so in fact, this slide probably uh, sums up uh, what I've just mentioned, that political uncertainty, of course, matters for risk premium. But uh, also, in addition, in one of the papers, uh, uh, from one of the papers, we knew that uh, premium um, is greater in bad economic conditions, that political uncertainty pushes up not only the premium, but also volatility on uh, and um, correlations in the stock market. And what is uh, also um, interesting uh, that uh, volatility and correlations are really have, uh, have very much affected by political uncertainty. Another important uh, thing here uh, uh, to understand the current situation uh, uh, in Russia, if investors believe that a change in the political course, like a new president or a new prime minister and a new team steps uh, um, and comes to office and uh, they start some reform, it may also increase volatility and correlations uh, in the stock market. And on the whole, the systemic risk arises as a result, which is bad for the economy. Now, uh, as regards the option uh, market per se, the option options is a financial tool which um, it's basically the price of the option is a kind of a mirror that reflecting the uh, market expectations uh, in respect of certain risks and the risk uh, that may be uh, linked up uh, with uh, various uh, reasons, uh, various causes such as weather, for example, so when in fact the risks are, uh, certainly ref uh, find their reflection in the option price. So the option contract do, will provide certain rights, but not an obligation to do something. So therefore Kelly uh, came up with a brilliant idea uh, to look at uh, into the options um, uh, uh, with maturities uh, that um, include um, uh, the certain uh, periods uh, such as the presidential elections uh, and how these particular events affect uh, the prices. And uh, he managed to uh, show that uh, such events as the election of a president, global summits, uh, affecting to a certain extent uh, the uh, political course, they really uh, uh, impact heavily the price of the option. So the premium risk uh, up to 25% actually, dependent. So it's, it's about two, one third of the profit margin that investors may require from the assets in a certain economy that are uh, related to the political situation, in fact. Now, at the end of the day, it all leads to the situation. We have uncertainty politically. You can assess it by the option market, and you can uh, embed into the future model assess of the assets. And you know that political uncertainty increases the price of the risk financing and it has happening in the what we do now this is the theory
Sergei Romanchuk, who is president of the ACR Russia, the association of traders dealing with uh, Forex. He, in Facebook, expressed wonderful idea that really elections that are coming in March, and everyone knows the result already, and it was known even half a year ago. What does it mean? It means that all the risks already included into the price, if we take. So this is methodology. We try to estimate how much volatility of these options impacting and what can be drawn out of them. You can say that the premium for political uncertainty in these prices should be zero because market knows everything already it's from one side. From the other hand, and this is the hypothesis that we're trying to check now and have unfortunately nothing to say because the results are quite raw yet. On the other hand, in our current situation, the effect on one side we know that ideally nothing will change on the other hand we know that we have quite high uncertainty and i'm coming to the end regarding concrete package of reforms that uh, will be enacted after march of this year all the previous year there were discussions between the ccr and the club and the situation ideally should increase the premium and political uncertainty and required profit margin that investors want to see. There are two opposing camps that we're trying to assess. At this time, I have nothing to say about this, but I hope that after three months there will be an article and again we will win from Gaidar Institute next year. presentation opening even more questions for us to discuss later for you to raise uh, Peter would you like to go next I think it's me yes okay so we're, I'm the last panelist on almost the last panel of a three-day conference um, but I'm still going to try and say something new uh, and I think it's new it, it was new to it's new to me uh, unfortunately it's probably wrong so that's that's the trade-off <laughs> It's new, but it's probably not accurate, convincing argument. So um, how can Russia get onto a more knowledge-intensive, non-resource-based, economic, sustainable growth path? How can it escape from the middle income trap? Um, look, look across the continent to China. China has been amazingly successful in the last five to 10 years in moving up the value chain in exporting high-tech manufacturing. Uh, Russia simply hasn't achieved that, even though Russia is uh, number three in the world in spending on R&D. They've been vastly overtaken by China in the number of patents filed, number of products, share of exports, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one small example of what we're talking about is um, take the case of a Korean Samsung, which spends like $13 billion a year on R&D. In contrast, Gazprom spends about $300 million on R&D. And Mr. Vexelberg from Inova yesterday said they're spending $700 million total investment this year. So just no comparison between the amount of investment it takes to become a global leader. The Russian firms aren't spending that money. The Russian state is spending the money, but the firms aren't, and that is the problem. Now, that's not a new argument. Lauren Graham, a brilliant historian of science, Soviet and Russian science, has written half a dozen books making the same point, taking it from Tsarist times through the Soviet period to the post-Soviet period, and it's the same story. Weak property rights, excessive role for the state, too much military spending by the state, uh, too much top-down management, and weak competition at the horizontal level among the firms. So that's not, not new. Uh, my new angle is to look back, starting with the British Industrial Revolution. Let's go back to the origins. So in 1772, in Stoke-on-Trent, which happens to be my hometown, Rodnoy Gorod, uh, Josiah Wedgwood, a pottery manufacturer, decided to put a steam engine into his factory to churn the clay 
for the pottery. Uh, why did he do that? That started the Industrial Revolution. He was the first person on the planet to put a steam engine into a factory to substitute coal power for human or animal power. Uh, and why did he do it? Partly it's because there's a lot of cheap coal there. Partly it was because there were good institutions, property rights. He knew he would capture the benefits of any productivity gains. Um, there were scientists around who'd invented the steam engine and who could make it work. Um, but all of those factors, good institutions, smart scientists, uh, were present in France and Germany too. They didn't have the coal, admittedly. But a key factor, economic historian Robert Allen argues, was that Britain had high wages. Forget about Angles and Dickens and those images of oppressed workers. Yes, they were oppressed, but they had higher wages than in the rest of Europe. And so there was an incentive for Josiah Wedgwood and other manufacturers to substitute capital for labor. Um, so you can see where I'm going with this. Um, apply the same argument to contemporary Russia and contemporary China. And the argument is that high wages provides an incentive for capitalists to invest. And it's not just switching from labor to capital. That won't generate productivity growth. But it, it creates an opportunity to introduce new technologies and new processes. And that puts you on this uh, rapid increase in, in total factor productivity. And the important point is that uh, this is getting into the question of shifting from export-led growth to domestic demand-led growth. Because the key to this success is the productivity gains can't just be confined to a few sectors, to like export sectors. They have to spread through the whole economy. So what you need is a kind of integrated domestic labor market where the wages will spread higher wages across many sectors. And this has the added advantage, as we see particularly in China, of creating large domestic demand so that the domestic manufacturers benefit from scale economies and steadily rising growth. It's also a kind of Keynesian type argument. Um, another important point to throw in there is that the real gains in most countries are coming from process, manufacturing process innovation such as Ben's uh, car factories in Russia, are not product innovation. So it's easier to pay attention to inventing new products, but the real productivity gains come in the manufacturing process, as with Mr. Wedgwood and his steam engine. He wasn't inventing a new product. He was inventing a radically more efficient way of making an existing product. Um, and this seems to be the key to China's success as well. Now. China's exports, which were important in getting them from being a low-income country to a middle-income country, only account for 10% of China's GDP. And the driver of Chinese growth is domestic demand. Um, moving on a bit quickly, so the backdrop to this over the last 10 years, obviously, is uh, impact of globalization, intensification of competition, across borders, so share of trade as a share of global GDP went up from 9% in 1970 to 52% in 2008, and it's fallen back a little bit to 45%, but it's still extremely high, and Russia, of course, is at about that 45 50% level. Uh, uh, intense competition, especially in manufacturing, the China price, in the last 10 years, the price of labor in China, coastal cities, has increased. So it's no longer competitive. And assembly plant manufacturers have moved out of China into Vietnam. Now, Vietnam's getting more expensive, talking about textile industry, for example. So they're moving into Bangladesh and uh, Indonesia. Um, and this intense competition tends to push wages down. So you've got these kind of contradictory uh, uh, forces at work here. And uh, labor share of GDP in Russia is very low by international standards. Depending on how you measure it, it's 5 or 10 percent below the OECD average. Um, uh, these figures are coming from one of Vladimir Mao's recent articles where he re recalculated it. And one 
peculiarity of Russia in the last 25 years is that, in fact, labor share was going up before 2008. It rose about 3% the, after the 1990s, which is very unusual. All, other, all the 25 OECD member countries, labor share has been falling. Russia's the only one where it went up, but it's still low. Um, what causes wages to rise? Various factors, obviously demographics. If you've got a, a, a flat, not increasing population uh, uh, or small population, uh, as is in China or 19th century Britain. If you have political factors, such as the mobilization of organized labor and democracy, that can push wages up. Or in China, you don't have democracy, but you do have a, a state that is committed to redistribution, to raising up the rural interior provinces. Um, now, in Russia, the demographics should be favorable to higher wages, although there is a, 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 with 10 million migrant workers in the country, that's pulling wages down. Um, but the main problem, I think, in Russia is uh, no integrated uh, national labor market and no political, no labor unions, no democracy to really push, push wages up. So wages remain uh, extraordinarily low in Russia and don't seem to be going anywhere. And uh, this is not new to anybody, but it's so important that you have to include it anyway. The oil curse is always in the background there. So uh, manufacturing only 20% of Russia's exports, I'm just putting these figures into underline how far a lot Russia is lagging behind uh, the other BRIC countries, even behind Brazil, which is another commodity exporter with, uh, with its own uh, soybeans and uh, lumber and iron ore and some oil. Um, what oil curse means in Russia, obviously, is that a small rent-seeking elite benefits from the status quo, and there's no political or economic reason why they should have any incentive to get on that productivity growth path or increase wages. The system's working fine for them. Why would they change it? They're not in the same position as Josiah Wedgwood, looking to improve his competitiveness. They're just not under any competitive pressure because of the oil and gas revenues. That follows through into overvalued exchange rate, depressed manufacturing, uh, imports dominated by uh, luxury goods that can't be produced inside the country. And so you get, you get a, a stable equilibrium, but it's not a growth equilibrium. Um, so what we need in the future, or what Russia needs in the future, is, is a profit-seeking elite to uh, uh, take some more of the power away from the rent-seeking elite and hopefully get on that virtuous growth path of high wages, high domestic demand, incentive to innovate, and put some of the brilliant minds and scientists in Russia uh, into the factories and into the technological chain. Um, and that could also have a political component, that if the liberals for the last 25 years, any talk about redistribution or social welfare has been equated with communism uh, or with socialism, and the liberals didn't want to go there, but I think arguments about redistribution, about equality, about tackling poverty, those are liberal arguments, and, and, and they can be highly compatible with uh, a more competitive market economy and positive incentives for uh, investment in technological innovation. Uh, however, the final slide is, having said all of that, I've tried these ideas out on a couple of Russian economics friends, and they showed me the door pretty quickly. They said, this is not going to happen. There are so many barriers to innovation in Russian uh, corporations, in the Russian markets. They're so uncompetitive. There's just, they couldn't imagine that this kind of growth cycle is going to take off. But I hope, I hope they're wrong. Thank you. May I throw my own small wrench into the works here again? <laughs> Agriculture's doing fine. You know, and as for it being commodity, you know, upstream, downstream, there's spillovers. Um, certain southern regions uh, are doing great. Agri Russia's actually now the number one exporter of, of, of grain abroad. It had its markets. It's sought them out, creased them, worked through the European Asian, Asian um, its new Asian community, you know, Eastern Asian. Uh, Alliance and community. So I think I think there's I think it's a bit pr provocative, but in the direction that that that, um, that you didn't envision. But let's see.
would you guys mind if we get ask the audience first before you reply to each other? Uh, let's see what you have to say. Questions? My first question to Maxim regarding Nadezhda Formation Academy of Science regarding political uncertainty on this site. Is there any data to compare at present moment political uncertainty in Russia and in America regarding the elections of Trump? Are these com comparable? I'll ask two questions, and then you'll answer. And I wanted to say thank you to Julian Johnson for a very interesting presentation. I have also two such questions. Maybe preparing article, especially presentation, maybe you considered those. This is rather my doubt rather than my decisions. I share my doubts. The established point of view that Russia is very much dependent on development on the financial flows from the West. Yes, but the question is, I know absolutely precisely when the sanctions were introduced in summer against Russia then Chinese Bank of Development, the employees, didn't go on vacation. They were sitting and waiting when Russians come for money. No one came for money to Chinese Bank of Development, and they were so surprised. Aside from Western market, there is a Oriental market. And uh, if you look at what's happening to the indicators that could uh, elucidate the situation from inside of the country, then today we have the lowest interest rates for the legal entities and individuals' credits and the lowest mortgage rates based on these considerations. Maybe you thought about this, really, how much Russia is dependent on financial flows from the West, let's say, and how much these measures, such as sanctions, how efficient sanctions are and how effective they are, how they affect Russia. I have another question to you. Very interesting presentation you had. That's why it creates a question. You were saying about dependence of Russia from the energy market. It is clear that this dependency was high. It goes down. But did you look at, by assessing situation today, talking about trends for the future, did you look at other sectors? Because the sanctions gave birth to specific changes of the economy of Russia. The Russia started to produce goods it never produced, and even part of these goods started to imp export and never exported before, save, just like you notice properly, production of wheat. There is a clear progress there that starts substituting export dependence from energy resources. I'd like to hear your considerations. That is very interesting considering your presentation and article. Thank you. Big questions, so thank you very much. And uh, oh, it's, it's it's wonderful to get a question that both starts by saying it was an interesting presentation that you enjoyed, and then 
um, takes issue with the two main uh, points that I that I've made. Um, yeah. So so to what extent is Russia still and will be for the longer term dependent on fin on finance from the West? Um, you know. Yes, yes, there are other options to the east, but it's not it's not the same. Um, you know, the kind of the kind of volume of finance you need, and the kind the kind of you know the kind of investment that's necessary, technological investment, is um, you know, is, is I think you know, investment in such quantity it, it it can only at this point come from. The West. There's no way. There's no way to fill in to fill in that gap, and I think that's in part because not 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 just because that you know Russia's dependent on international capital, full stop, but because of the other things I mentioned, that that international capital in Russia has substituted for so many other things. It 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 has substituted for a healthy domestic financial sector. It has substituted for um, the fact that you you have. Massive capital flight, and that is still there. That problem has not gone away, um, and it has it has it has substituted for other for other kinds of investment, you know, domestic investment that ought to be taking place. So, you know, I think there's I think there's a real opportunity now because of sanctions to try to uh, to try to draw in investment from other from other regions of the world, right? Maybe, uh, but uh, but I don't think. You know, I don't think it will be enough, um, and you know, especially in, in a situation like you have now, where there's uh, there are issues with the budget. Um, you know, so the so so the need the need for investment both you know, on the government level and for private companies is 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 going up rather than down. The need for investment. Um, from from outside, you know, I yeah, I, I don't I don't see this um, I don't see this structural vulnerability going away anytime soon. Similarly, if we talk about dependence on the energy market, yeah, I, I agree. Actually, things are getting a little bit better. Um, there's you, you know you do have new products. Uh, Russia is exporting things that it hasn't ex exported before, and in this sense, the fact that you've had both the, you know the combination of sanctions and lower oil prices has I, has I think been Productive, but again, that doesn't substitute for the kind of institutional development that is going to make that progress sustainable over the longer term. So, I, in, in some, you know, I, I think, I think, yes, perhaps you're right that that I that, that my description was a bit too bleak, um, but uh, but the problems the problems remain, um, and the solutions remain the same as well. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in, well, indeed, uh, uh, this side there are uh, U.S. indices, but depends. Uh, well, the methodology varies uh, from one country to another. For the as for the United States, uh, the political uncert uncertainty is. Uh, uh, determined not uh, by one newspaper like Commerzant. Um, it is um, done on the basis of uh, reports from 10 different uh, agencies. Well, of course, uh, you can look at the volatility as well, and uh, where you can see that Indeed, during the last, uh, in the recent years, uh, in the recent year and a half, maybe, uh, this um, volatility has increased uh, significantly, I should say so. But you can browse through that, and you can find in very interesting things there. Sergei Afonsev, Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, let me ask uh, you in uh, Russian a question to Mr. Ratland. Uh, you raised a very important issue, uh, which is uh, related to the incentives uh, uh, salary incentives um, uh, in terms of economic and development and political changes. This issue uh, attracted uh, the attention, was in the focus of uh, Russian scientists, and we've seen a number of publications uh, devoted to possible uh, aftermath of uh, lowering uh, the wages uh, or increase in wages. Nevertheless, there are two questions that will affect uh, the uh, 
uh, this debate uh, and, uh, well, and the discussions around this uh, question. So we have an impression that uh, in Russia the level of wages is very low and so we need to increase it somehow. But that uh, conflicts with two observations. First observation is the low level of uh, salaries uh, uh, against uh, GDP. Uh, as, as a share in GDP. The second is uh, there are certain uh, doubts regarding the uh, wages and its correlation with labor productivity ratio. So as for the first point, it I think uh, there's a very simple rule that is at work here. If you have a high share of uh, capital intensive uh, sectors in the economy, you will have a low uh, share of uh, wage uh, share in GDP. In the Russia, there is a high uh, share of um, uh, extracting industries uh, in the economy. That's why there's uh, five percentage points uh, deviation from ECD, uh, from OECD. That's a, that's a real f uh, fact. So, but in in this sense, the situation in Russia is quite normal, which is not. Uh, 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 justified by some extraordinary conditions. As for the ration between the salary and uh, the labor productivity, so uh, Kapilushnikov uh, referred to that uh, um, in his work, uh, which shows that there are no radical deviations uh, from uh, the expected economic models. If Russia is a normal country in terms of uh, labor remuneration, so what kind of resources uh, do you think we can use to increase uh, this incentive, the salary in the Russian economy? Well, I understand it should be some kind of movement towards a new balance, um, as a result of which uh, we can end up in a higher level of uh, wages. It may uh, be a change in the budget uh, sphere, uh, the, the, the uh, radical change in the budget sphere that we tried to do a few years ago, but somehow we failed to do that. Also, the structural uh, changes uh, in favor of uh, more labor-intensive types of the economy. Uh, well, perhaps also maybe some kind of uh, policies related to uh, wage uh, level regulation, maybe using the trade unions. I don't know. Maybe there are some other tools, some other leverages that may uh, help Russia to increase the level of salaries. Uh, thank you. Well, I only started with this idea um, two weeks ago, so this is a new idea because I, I, I read for the first time Robert Allen's work. Yeah, so I'm only just starting to think about it, but those are great points that you made, and uh, uh, maybe it is uh, an impossible task. But if, if I look at the uh, Chinese case or the Brazil case, they were also in some kind of low equilibrium before, low productivity, low wage before, and various factors got them out of it. Sometimes it's a crisis factor, like the Cultural Revolution. Uh, in the case of Brazil, I think it was democracy and strong labor unions and uh, Lula coming to power and so on. So there's a lot of uh, very contingent factors. So I, I don't have a kind of easy answer to this uh, very important question. Uh, may I ask you a question? A question to uh, Christopher Granville. My uh, name is uh, Igor Makarenko, Managing Director of uh, Civil Consent uh, Foundation Novosibirsk. Uh, um, well, um, uh, under the Russian realities, we live in a, a kind of uncertainty, in a fog of uncertainty. The level of uncertainty after 2014 it, I think, is at its highest. Um, uh, 2018, I think, it's a kind of a reference uh, year that may lead us to um, absolutely unexpected consequences. The Russian Federation has uh, failed to overcome some bifurcation points. Uh, um, as a result, uh, certain development institutions are, in fact, uh, invalidated. 
are uh, we are live in conditions of total stagnation yeah. getting back to the situation of uh, 1983 84 uh, do you agree with such uh, uh, assertions uh, or maybe you can see some other drives in russia that we are incapable of seeing here it's quite an interesting question well perhaps the most important question of the entire forum uh, how to answer best um, to give you the best answer yeah what about the central bank what about the outside view national monetary fund that the russia's potential rate of growth is uh, now around 1.5 percent year on year real change in gdp 1.5 percent maximum two that's a very modest potential rate of growth so in a sense the central bank itself is agreeing with your uh premise that this is uh Obviously, any growth is better than none, especially if you've just been in recession. But nevertheless, this is not, um, call it stagnation if you like, but this is not a dynamic uh, development. And the political leadership has set the goal for the next political cycle that uh, the Russian economy should grow no slower on average than the global average real GDP growth. Uh, that Russia there should therefore not fall behind in relative terms the rest of the world uh, as a whole uh, and everyone has agreed that to achieve that uh, you need deep uh, structural reforms to raise the potential level of GDP growth in a way which is sustainable not just a quick blast of growth with inflation which then drags down incomes and uh, and you lose the advantage so I guess that uh, I'd agree with your premise on the question of what are the institutional changes or or the reduction in uncertainty uh, that that might uh, that might allow for that um well maxime and his team are working brilliantly on this topic so perhaps uh, uh but nevertheless since i have the floor uh, let me just add a word about this question of political uncertainty which maxime uh, was uh, speaking about i mean that kind of analysis of trying to isolate or identify that component of the risk premium in asset prices which might be attributed to political uncertainty or, or uncertainty about future policies uh, using option market option pricing as as the um, empirical basis uh, i think that the tr that the trouble with that applied to the russian situation is that the the uncertainties in russia uh, exist over such a longer time span uh, than simply one election cycle. Uh, at present, as Maxim says, everything seems to be priced in. We know the result of your election coming up in a few weeks' time. Uh, the policy framework is set. There are interesting questions about taxation, pension reform, and so on, but, uh, but there's no huge uncertainties uh, of a fundamental nature. But the more fundamental uncertainty, of course, is that in an institutional framework where there is only one institution which functions, which is the presidency, uh, which is anchored in popular assent, uh, the uncertainty about the succession to the presidency. Uh, and that, in my opinion, uh, is very difficult to measure in option prices because the duration is so much longer. But no, long-term commitment to capital investment, no, a, a full CapEx cycle, for an industrial enterprise being at least 10 years. Uh, and there's a date out there called 2024. Uh, what might happen after that? Well, you could argue in this institutional framework, if the political establishment seems to retain the support of the public, which is the institutional anchor for legitimacy, then when there is a change at the very top, uh, if that support is there, there will be continuity of policy. But our business owners and people who want to commit long-term capital can, will they rely on that? The answer is probably not, or not enough. And it's that, that seems to be, that would be my gloss on this question of the institutional environment of, of, of political uncertainty. And therefore I'm, I'm agreeing, sir, with, with, with your premise and uh, elaborating a bit on it. But, 
I mean, Carol, can I quickly just come back to the previous question from the lady sitting in, in the front Please, row course, and, yeah. and the, uh, Juliet's points? I, mean, I think that um, I'd like to just strike a little bit more optimistic uh, note that Juliet uh, said that each cycle of crisis uh, helps the authorities to cope better with the next one. They learn lessons, and that's the good news. But then she, she raised a doubt that that very success, paradoxically, might breed complacency that if you get better at dealing with crises, you have a, a weaker incentive to address the root causes of those crises. Well, I'd just like to qualify that a little bit. First, I completely agree with your analytical framework. The, the, the institu crisis is an institution, and it, has, it has very, often has very positive effects, not wanting in any way to disparage the short-term pain. You mentioned the catastrophe of 1998 an overnight reduction in living standards of uh, the, the, the population of Russia by a third. I mean, that is a calamity, right up there with Greece and the single currency and so on. But the result was that if we, in my sort of 30 second summary of the institutional history of Russian economy in two decades, Kratky Kurs, Kratky Kurs is story, uh, is that the lesson learned was fiscal adjustment and the result was the stabilization fund, uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy of an exemplary kind. Uh, and of course, you say that made in 2008 the next shock, uh, uh, Russia had 10% of GDP saved up in its fiscal buffers and was able to cushion the effect of the population. The public Russian GDP collapsed by 8% year on year in 2009, and that was largely the effect of capital outflow. I mean, other oil exporters had nothing like the same recession after the global financial crisis. So again, I'd agree with you. But um, the fiscal buffers allowed the population to be cushioned very largely from, from that effect. But in that period between 98 and 2008, they learned the fiscal lesson, but they did not learn the monetary lesson. They continued with negative real interest rates a pegged exchange rate, which is always a disaster, always, always and everywhere, uh, in the end, especially if you are an open economy dependent on highly volatile external prices. It's lunacy to peg your exchange rate. Saudi Arabia, by the way, will collapse uh, because of that, uh, uh, unless and until it, it's a, uh, it goes to a free-floating exchange rate. But here, Julius, is where I would uh, take issue a little bit, um, because I think that uh, the uh, the result of the latest crisis is that the monetary policy lesson was learned. We've now gone to a floating exchange rate of the ruble. And this is an institutional change which reduces the vulnerabilities in the future. Uh, it allows the economy to adapt to future volatility in the external price of the commodities uh, which remain so important to the Russian economy and in that way reduces the dependency. It doesn't eliminate it, but it reduces it. And that's an extremely positive effect. And I make one further point, is that um, in life you get virtuous circles and you get vicious circles. And if you have a success, you have a chance of a virtuous circle. And there is one here. Inflation targeting means that we now have in Russia positive real interest rates. Steady. You, as a Russian saver, you put your money into a bank, into a mutual fund, you will get a real return. Uh, the savings instrument of choice was dollar bills under the mattress, real estate. Now, financial intermediation uh, for savings is, is possible because there is stably positive real interest rates. This, in turn, will allow the mobilization of domestic savings on a longer-term duration for investing in longer-term projects, other things being equal, such as political uncertainty. I mean, there's obviously massive obstacles. But in this way, you get uh, some positive cycle, and then therefore less dependence on short-term volatile foreign capital to finance investment needs. So I would, I would posit the, uh, the, the, how the institutional framework can degrade, but it can also improve. One success leads to another. Разрешите? Еще один вопрос, можно? May I ask you one more question, please? Georgi Barshevsky, uh, Ranipa, uh, sorry for uh, asking for my seat. I um, uh, would like to say thanks to all the participants for this very interesting uh, discussion. A question to Vladimir Gelman. Uh, 
Well, perhaps I misunderstood you, but or perhaps there were certain contradictions in your uh, reasoning. Uh, so as far as I understood, your first message was that uh, over the last decade in the Western countries, we've seen the growing role of experts who have started to have a uh, greater impact on political decision making, uh, even um, concepts such as dictatorship of experts as they impose their opinion on certain politicians. Uh, so in the recent years, the reforms uh, that were proceed uh, on a technocratic basis uh, actually were failed. On the other hand, you said that in Russia, the role of experts in political decision making uh, continues to be quite uh, low because on the one hand they experience the pressure of bureaucrats but on the other hand by political acts so the experts in fact can offer nothing and uh, whatever they uh, propose uh, nothing can be done uh, so this is a kind of crossroads here if we uh, strengthen the role of experts and we are all experts in this room if we uh, strengthen the role of experts in the political decision making, we would face uh, the world uh, trend uh, that uh, technocratic reforms uh, are a failure. On the other hand, if we face a situation when the experts decide nothing, uh, we will continue the trend towards uh, uh, politically motivated reform, which will uh, bring us to a uh, blind alley. Obviously, you perceived m my thoughts in the normative, not in the positive aspect. But I did discussed how it is in fact. It's absolutely about a different story. The plot related to the influence of technocratic reforms on the economic policy had to do mostly with the recommendations of the World Bank in terms of the economic policy in the countries of the third world. It's an easterly book I mentioned. It's dedicated, this book is dedicated, it, it is for sale on the first floor. I spoke about absolutely different things. I spoke about technocrats participating in development of the economic policy, but the problem is this. Their influence is limited because they don't possess control over the instruments of realization of this policy except for certain sectors of industry. For instance, financial policy that is in detail analyzed by Julie is example of the success story. Look at the other spheres outside of the financial and tax policy. You will see how ideas of conducting reforms face with the in groups of interest and inability of bureaucracy to implement these decisions. However, I state the technocratic mechanism till now remain and will remain for some near future. It will be the only way of realization of economic policy. Even more so, I'm, I'm inclined to think that if the transition from technocratic to political model happen, it will not improve and even possibly worsen the policy in the short term, at least. Thank you. We have to bring this to an end. Uh, but let me say we, uh, we've got some remarkable expressions. I like the idea that uh, these are no boilerplate in institutions. I think that came from Christopher. Uh, Purpose-built institutions. One of you said that. And um, technocratic, technocratic evolution. Uh, much depends upon the people and the moment when the institutions uh, can be changed, as well as the barriers that we all know exist. Um, so thank you very much for your wonderful questions. Thank you, participants, for really great uh, presentations. Thank you.